All right. Good morning. Thank you for all you lovely people who are on time. Also, if you have not done your vocabulary homework from yesterday, it is officially late. Because remember, you have 24 hours to do each assignment. So today you're going to have a review question. Instead of code words, we're just going to do tiny review questions. That way you can actually get points from it. And um, it is due by class tomorrow. So if you did not do your vocab, I repeat, it is now officially late. Make sure you get it done today. So real quick, I just wanted to go over this lovely poem from e-learning the other day. I've been meaning to do that. I think everyone's finally done with it now. So let me read you the poem. Little fish. One little fish swam in his dish. He blew bubbles and made a wish. All he wanted was another fish to swim with him in his little dish. Another fish came one day to blow bubbles while they played. Two little fish blowing bubbles in a dish, swimming around, singing plish, plish, plish. So some of us struggled with this poem, which makes me sad. But there were tons of A lines. A is always the first, and that ends in fish. So fish, dish, wish, fish, dish, fish, fish, dish, plish, all rhyme together. So line one, two, four, six, eight, nine, 13, 15, and 17 were all A lines. And then of course our next line is B, bubbles was B. So three, 11, and 14 were B lines. C was wanted. That was the only C line. Line five was the only C line. D was him. That was the only D line was seven. Line 10. We already talked about line 10 rhymes with 12 because day and played rhyme. So 10 and 12 should have both been E's. And then lastly, 16 was F and that was around. So if you got points wrong on those, now you know why. And there's our lovely poem. Last week, we started module three, which is all about natural disasters. And today, it is eruption. So can someone right now raise your hand and tell me, just based off that title, oh, wait, and it says volcanoes and the science to saving lives, eruption. What are we going to be talking about, Nolan? Volcanoes erupting. Yeah, we're going to be talking about volcanoes in this story. It's a good one. I like this story. Um, so first off, we need to read about this genre. So hopefully you're following along on my Fine. But let's read about the genre. So the genre is narrative nonfiction. What does that mean? gives factual information by telling a story. So a narrative is a story, but it's not fiction. So it's giving us factual information through a story. I repeat, narrative nonfiction gives factual information by telling a story. And then here's some other little blurbs about narrative nonfiction. Narrative nonfiction author presents I, events in sequential or chronological order. I need someone to raise their hand right now and tell me what that means. We have talked about sequential or chronological order like 500 times. Um, Presley, can you unmute yourself? Tell me what sequential or chronological order means. Those words are um, synonyms. What does that mean, Presley? Wait, she said chronological order and sequential. What do they mean? Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you, ma'am. I guess like it's not working. Presley, I could definitely hear you. Sorry, this thing okay. is not working. Well, I can hear you when you say that. <laughs> this is not working. Um, sequential and chronological mean chronological means in right order. order so first this happens then this happens then this happens then this happens just like your day today we sequence so um put your day in sequential order reading rti math rti reading class math okay that's sequential or chronological order so that's how our story is going to be told um doing this helps readers understand what events happened and how they're connected Narrative nonfiction often includes visuals such as photos. Captions um, explain the photos and details of the text. 
So um, there are some photos in this story and we will see them and there'll be a caption for each photo. So it'll explain the photo for us. Because with illustrations, we don't need an explaining. But for um, photographs, we do. And then text written about events um, related to science or social studies may include words that are specific to the topic. And we talked about that the other day. Um, sometime, I know we've talked about it. And they are, what are they? Um, of course, I can't think of the word right now. But they are, oh, they're content-specific words. So in our story, we might find words that are content-specific. So a content area class would be social studies or science. So we might find words that are specific to social studies or science. So the title is Volcano. Oh, no, I lied. <laughs> Sorry. It's eruptions, volcanoes, and the science to saving lives. So obviously, it's going to be about some eruption of a volcano and hopefully about saving lives. But I'm going to scroll down a teeny little bit and... Here are our vocabulary words again, seismographs, reservoirs, consequences, alarming, victim, widespread, conferring, and evacuation. I know I read those in a silly order, but we learned about those yesterday. And hey, let's meet the author. Why not? I want to learn more about her. So here is our author, lovely lady right here, Elizabeth Rauch. Rauch. As a child, Elizabeth dreamed up and performed plays with her best friend. So even as a child, she's got a creative imagination, okay? She dreams up plays, performs them with her best friend. Later, after studying economics in college, her first job was at a magazine for teachers. So economics is like, um, well, Rochelle, if it's not loading, you can just follow along with me on here. I'm sharing my screen. Economics is like the economy, okay? So she studied some math and things like that. But her first job was a magazine for teachers. So maybe a magazine that Mrs. Kneifel would be interested in. Since she had no experience as a writer, Elizabeth was assigned to be a copy editor. Her boss was stunned when Elizabeth said she wasn't good at spelling and grammar, but she promised to look up everything. Now Elizabeth writes about anything that interests her and is inspired by exploration and discovery. She has written more than a dozen, a dozen children's books and has more than 100 magazine articles. Okay. So this lovely author of ours got a job in a magazine and is bad at spelling and grammar. Okay, if you're editing, you need to be good at those things. But apparently she was super determined. And guess what? Now she has over a dozen children's books and over 100 magazine articles. That is quite a lot. All right, so we are going to head to pay. Here is our title page. Here's, or here's our cover. Um, so it's by Elizabeth and photographs by Tom Yulman. Yulman? However you say that. So these are real photographs, not illustrations, because it says photographs. It doesn't say illustrations. All right. Ullman. Yeah, however you say it. Ullman. Ooh, it's kind of small. Let me see if I can zoom. All right. Paragraph one. When the Colombian volcano... Navidado del Ruiz erupted in 1985, United States Geological Survey, USGS, scientist Andy Lockhart was horrified by the tragedy. A tragedy is something bad. It's something obviously not good. A volcano erupting was considered a tragedy. A year later, he became one of the earliest members of the volcano crisis team called the Volcano Disaster Assistance Program, VDAP. The VDAP's mission was to bring equipment and knowledge to areas threatened by volcanoes in order to predict eruptions and prevent catastrophes. So, would we in Indiana need this VDAP program? No, we wouldn't because we don't have volcanoes in Indiana. So we wouldn't need this. So thank you for those guys that were just shaking your head. We wouldn't need this program in Indiana. And so the goal of this program is to hopefully try to predict eruptions, which you can't always do, and to prevent catastrophes. So catastrophes are just seriously bad things that happen, basically. Six years after the program started, Chris Newhall, another VDAP scientist, got a call about steaming shoots from Mount Pinatoba, a mountain in the Philippines. Until this happened... Most people thought Mount Pinatoba was a huge jungle-covered mountain, not a volcano. Chris knew it was serious. He and the team had to do something. 
he and the fellow VDPA scientists, Andy Lackar and Rick Hablett, set out to try and predict Mount Pinatoba's next move. They worked from Clark Air Base very close to the volcano. Okay, so this is kind of like a little bit of a foreword. It's giving us some background information. So in Columbia, a volcano went off and it caused major destruction. So that is why this scientist, Andy Lockhart, was like, hey, we need to start something to help people know when this, to try to know when this is going to happen. So this Andy guy was like, you know what? Let's start something. Let's try to predict these. Let's help others. So that's how they invented the VDAP, Volcano Disaster Assistance Program. And now there's Mount Pinatoba. I know it looks funny, but it's pronounced Pinatoba. And it's in the Philippines. And everyone just thinks it's a jungle-covered mountain. But then steam starts shooting from it. Okay, well, obviously it's not a mountain if steam's coming through it. And that's when they find out, oh, snap, this is a volcano. They think it's a mountain, but now all of a sudden there's steam, which means something is happening with inside of it. So... They now are at Clark Air Base and they're trying to figure out, is this going to erupt? Is it something random? How can we help people? How can we evacuate people, et cetera, et cetera. So there are, they are on the hunt to figure out what is happening with this newly found volcano. Remember, it's not a newly found mountain. It's a newly found volcano. It's always been a mountain, but now they also know it's a volcano. May 28th, okay? Oh, by the way, let's think real quick. So the program started a year after the eruption in 1985. So now it's 1986. And now it's six years after the program started. So six years after 1986 would be 1992. So it's 1992, I believe, on May 28th. Chris got a new gas reading from Mount Pinatoba. Sulfur dioxide has jumped tenfold to twenty to 5,000 tons a day. The volcano was definitely ramping up. Tenfold, that just means a lot. Like it jumped tenfold. It jumped largely. So sulfur dioxide is coming out of this volcano at 5,000 tons a day. Okay, well, a ton is 2,000 pounds. So that's 5,000 times 2,000. That's a lot. Okay, that's but a lot. That's of like a million, I think. Yeah, that's a lot of sulfur dioxide coming from this volcano. So it's ramping up. It's getting more and more every day. A few days later, instruments recorded two unusual earthquakes. A shallow, continuous, rhythmic shaking known as a low-frequency earthquake magma was moving towards the surface and releasing more gas. Then the seismograph recorded the first earthquake directly under the vent. So this low mount, well, this mountain is erupting steam, erupting gas. Oh, my goodness. And now there's two earthquakes. One's like a tiny, continuous one, but now one. Now there's another one, and it means that magma, which is like hot lava is coming closer to the surface. Obviously not good things. Over the next few weeks, the volcano spat steam higher and higher into the sky. The plume changed color from white to gray. Then the volcano began shooting rock and ash, but the geologists tested the ash and found no sign of fresh lava. The steam explosion explosives were just tossing up old material. Would the volcano erupt or would it just spit steam until it slipped back into dormancy? So there's a question right there. We don't know what's going to happen. But there is a little one next to that dormancy, and that is called the footnote. So here's the one after dormancy, and here's the footnote that, te- oh, goodness, that tells us what dormancy is. So dormancy is the period during which a volcano is potentially or is temporarily inactive. So this Mount Pinatoba has been in dormancy for however long. People had no idea this was even a volcano. So it's been in dormancy for like a really long time, but now it's out of dormancy and it's spitting all this steam, but no new lava. So they're like, okay, is it just like all of a sudden making random, you know, coming about, but is it just going to go back to dormancy? We don't know. And also, if you don't know what a plume is, when you think of, I'm going to draw it real quick of a volcano in like cartoons. I'm gonna draw it. Here's Mrs. Kanaipo's lovely volcano, okay? And the plume is like, I'm sorry that it keeps on glitching. I don't know how to solve that. You might just have to watch the recording. The plume is like the little mushroom of steam around the volcano, okay? So that would be like what the plume is like. It's that looks like the little mushroom of the steam and stuff. 
Okay, so it's still May 28th. Well, we, that's when we started. Then the sulfur dioxide plummeted from 5,000 tons to one to 1,300. And to, it, oh my goodness. I'm sorry. Then the sulfur dioxide plummet, plummeted from 5,000 tons to 1,300 to 260 a day. That could mean the volcano was settling down. Okay, that's a good thing. We want the volcano to settle down. Okay, that's good. Dun, 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 dun. Or dot, dot, dot. It could mean the volcano's vent was clogged with the building pressure. Andy and the other scientists watched the seismograph around the clock. If you're watching something around the clock, that means 24-7. So someone's always watching these seismographs, which remember, record data about earthquakes. So someone is watching it 24-7 around the clock. They saw bigger quakes, longer quakes, and harmonic tremors, a constant humming earthquake that often means magma is rising and boiling away groundwater. Okay, not good. Oh, look, there's a two after that groundwater. So we're going to head down to the footnote at the bottom of the page. Groundwater. Water found underground in cracks in sand, soil, and rocks. Okay, that's kind of self-explanatory. Groundwater? Yeah, water underground. Hopefully we knew that without the footnote. The Americans and Filipinos each have their own alert system, alert level system. The VDAP scientists debated, was it time to raise the alert to three, high and increasing unrest, eruption possible in two weeks? Ray, the head of the Filipino geologists, would need time to spread any warning to people scattered in villages all around Pinatoba. He raised his alert level to three, eruption possible in two weeks. About 10,000 members of the Aida tribes were moved to evacuation camps. Oh, there's another footnote, Aida tribes. Tribes of people native to the island of Luzon in the Philippines. Okay, so here's what this means. The people of the VDA decided to raise the level of their severity of this volcano, meaning people are going to have to now start evacuating. We know what evacuating means. It means leaving somewhere dangerous to somewhere safer. And in the Philippines, it is not as um, developed as the United States. It would be easy for us to evacuate uh, LaPorte County. We could easily go somewhere else. We hop in our cars. No big deal. But people in the Philippines, especially the people in these tribes, they're scattered out all around there may not be the perfect roads it's not like there's transportation necessarily available so it's a lot harder to get these people to evacuate the quakes accelerated we know what acceleration is like in a car moving forward going faster magma moving all along the conduit was shaking the ground deep in the earth and quite near the surface what's a conduit i don't know let's look at that footnote number four a channel of move for moving some type of liquid. So a conduit just means, okay, I'm pretty sure other people can hear me, Evan, just be following along in the story. You might have to watch the recording. My volume's up all the way. Other people seem to be hearing me. Remember the chat should only be for academic things. So a conduit means it's a channel for moving liquid. I lost my spot. Oh. More and more steam and ash poured from the cracks of the volcano called the for fumaroles. The volcanologists, remember, those are people who study volcanoes, estimated the size of the magma chamber, the reservoir of melted rock and gas under the volcano, and the potential size of the eruption. The eruption could be 10 times larger than the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens, which was bigger than any living ge geologist had ever seen. Okay, so this seems to be a little bit serious. All of these um, scientists are studying what they've been trained to study. Me and you couldn't be reading these seismographs. Me and you could not be talking about, you know, could not guess how big this reservoir of collecting lava is, okay? We couldn't guess that. But these geologists and stuff, that's what their jobs are. And they're guessing that this reservoir is so big that it might be bigger than any earthquake um, eruption that any living person has seen. Okay, that's not good. Military officers listen intense, intentively to the geologist briefing. At the end of one, Major General William Struder asked, what would you do? The scientist answered, move the dependents off the base. 
The officers relocated pregnant women and the elderly. The Air Force newspaper and TV station began broadcasting details of the eruption plan. What to bring and where to go. Okay, so this story moves pretty fast, okay? You're like, oh my God, we were just learning about this earthquake and now all of a sudden people are erupting or people are evacuating. So it moves really fast. But remember, they are at an air, um, an air base, like an Air Force base mm -hmm. in the Philippines. So the scientists are like, okay, here's what's happening. So one of the military generals is like, okay, in your expert opinion, what should we do? What should I do? you know, with all the people. And they're like, get them off the base, the dependent people. Dependent people are people that cannot easily take care of themselves. Children, pregnant women, the elderly. You cannot necessarily easily take care of yourself as much as like a full grown able man. You know, upon, I mean, maybe not in real life, but there's different things about that. So anyways, what would anyone like to make a prediction for me? What do you think is going to happen next? What do we think is going to happen next? Based on what we read in these two pages about this volcano, you know, there was a tons of sulfur dioxide, but now the sulfur dioxide is going down. But now they think maybe it's clogged, but now there's all these bigger earthquakes and longer earthquakes. And the scientists are like, evacuate, get things off. Oh my gosh. Someone uh, raise their hand. Actually, you know what? Tell me in the chat. What do we think? If you have the chat close to you, if you want to, if you have a chat idea, what do you think is going to happen right now? Make a prediction for me. Based on what the scientists have observed so far, what do you think is going to happen next? Can you slow down a little, please? Yes. All right, lots of you have answered. And I'm pretty much with you guys. You're thinking, okay, based on the evidence, we think it's going to erupt soon. We think it's going to explode soon. We think that this volcano is going to erupt based on the evidence. All right, we're going to turn the page. All right. The earthquakes got even closer to the surface. The steam plume reached 28,000 feet, the highest so far. So remember that little diagram I showed you, you know? Hey, let's not be making silly jokes, okay? I just asked, what do you think is going to happen? So the plume, the diagram I showed you, is now reaching 28,000 feet in the air. That's, like, really far. Let's look. How long is a mile? How many feet is a mile? So, fun fact. A mile is about 5,000 feet, okay? It's well, it's 5,280 feet. And this is reaching 28,000 feet. So let's do a quick math problem because Ms. Knifel wants to do a math problem. So 28,000 divided by 5,280. So this plume, remember this little thing that I drew you, is go oh, I just hit my computer, is going over five that or five miles in the air. It's going up five miles in the air that is a huge that's how far this steam and sulfur dioxide is being shot up five miles that's a lot that's like westville um i'm trying to think where would five miles be um our school to um pnc is three miles so it's even more than our school to pnc so that's that's a lot after conferring with vdap scientist Ray raised his alert to level four, enlarging the evacuation zone for the local population. Filipinos all around the volcano packed a few possessions and walked or rode carts down the mountain. So like I said, it's not developed as what it is now, or is it like the United States? So people can't just get in their cars and evacuate. They need extra time because they have to walk or ride carts to evacuate. VDA P members debated, should we move to level four? The Air Force had said the DAP's level four is a trigger for Clark to be evacuated. Evacuating 14,000 people and million dollars of equipment would be a huge challenge and a huge burden to the military and their families. So let's think about this, okay? Let's put this into perspective. I know this is a little bit hard to understand because it is like a real life thing and it's nonfiction. So we're in the Philippines. 
people are starting to evacuate people that um people that live in the philippines are starting to evacuate but there's this air force base called clark also in the philippines and if they raise the um urgent level to a level four, then they have to evacuate the military base. And the military base has 14,000 people on it. And of course, millions of dollars worth of equipment, equipment that is measuring the volcano and just other military equipment. So they're like, oh my gosh, if we raise to a level four, then we have to evacuate all these people. It's going to take a lot of time and a lot of money to evacuate all these people and all this stuff. But if we don't evacuate and the volcano explodes, then people could die and the stuff will be destroyed anyways. So they're kind of in a dilemma. They're not sure what to do. Do we raise to a level four and evacuate and spend all this money and all this time? Or do we stay and hope that the volcano doesn't go off? That's pretty much their dilemma right now. Some BDAP members thought they should. Then the volcanoes diminished. Oh, I'm sorry. Then the earthquakes diminish. The diminish means that it's less now. So the earthquakes aren't as fast as they aren't as bad. They're going down. Okay. So what does that mean, guys? Volcanoes don't necessarily move from deep sleep to violent eruption in a straight, orderly progression. Marissa said, you need to do these. And he said, they ramp up, drop down, ramp up, and drop down. The trend at Pinatoma was ramping higher and dropping down less. Any single episode of ramping up could lead to a full-blown eruption. But it could all just peter out to nothing. The scientists had to predict the unpredictable. The consequences. A costly false evacuation or tragic loss of life weighed heavily on their minds and their hearts. So this is literally what I just said. These scientists are trying to predict the unpredictable because remember, some, a lot of natural disasters are not 100% predictable, especially earthquakes and volcanoes. You can try to predict them, but you may never be right. So they're moving it up, maybe a, um, a volcano eruption in two weeks. Do we really know? No, they don't. So this is their dilemma. Do we have this costly false evacuation, meaning we move all these people, we move all this equipment, it costs us so much money but we save people or do we not do anything and people die if this erupts and these are this is what's facing these scientists minds they're like oh my gosh you know could you imagine trying to make that decision you're like i don't want to be in charge of people's lives like that is crazy on june 20 on june 8th so remember our last date was may 28th now it's june 8th so it's been like 11 days i think on June 8th, a chapter lifted off to give scientists a closer view of the summit. The sky cleared. They could see that a big, ugly gray blob of rock had poked out of the east crater wall. It was a lava dome. Cold, hard, heavy rock could be clogging the vent. With magma moving up with nowhere to go, the pressure building, this this could blow with deadly results. So the summit would be the top of the volcano, the top of the mountain. And they could see the side of it. There's a lava dome. So that's just like poking out of the side of the volcano. There's this big dome, you know, like a sem uh, semicircle. Oh my gosh, this could mean it's going to blow. We don't know what's going to happen. Oh my goodness. Dun, 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 dun. The scientists told the Air Force commander the new development and waited for them to take action. Then, the next morning, June 9th, when Andy and his colleagues hopped into the helicopter, it took a detour to the center base. A detour, I feel like we've talked about this one time this year already, but in case we don't know, a detour is an alternate path. So, if I had to drive from my house to, what, to school, I would take... My road, Greenway Road, 421 Valparaiso Street. Or I could take a detour and go through town. That would be a waste of time, but take a detour. General Struder and his second-in-command climbed aboard. The helicopter headed for the volcano. Instead of billowing steam and ash, only a thin snake of a yellow-gray plume drifted up from the summit. Geez, that's a lot of ash, the general commented. That's nothing, the volcanologist said. They pointed out the underlying, they pointed out how underlying the jungle all around the mountain was a sign of massive ancient pyroclastic flow. 
That's all ash from the last eruption. The helicopter turned and the widespread devastation once brought by the volcano became impossible to miss. The general started, stared silently out the window as the helicopter headed back to base. Finally, he turned to the second in command. Do it tomorrow, he said. So, sequential. This is super easily laid out in sequential. It is a stressful story. I agree, Paisley. There's like people that got to make these serious decisions. So it's a conventional order. It was first May 28th on the last page, and now it is June 8th, and now it is June 9th. So it's showing us how it's going this and how it's going this. And and what do it tomorrow? Do what tomorrow? We're going to assume, based on this information of this crazy volcano, that he's saying evacuate tomorrow. So the commanders officially decided let's do it tomorrow, meaning let's evacuate tomorrow. So here's a picture of... Three people in military uniforms and a picture um, posted, or a person taking a picture and a helicopter. Mount Pinatoba steams behind the Air Force helicopter. So you can see in the background of the photo, let me get to the photo. In the background of the photo, you can see all of the steam and the plume from the volcano and these people getting themselves a little picture, okay? Okay, well, if you're... Okay, Ava, right now is not time to ask about homework. Mia, if you missed a little bit, you're going to have to re you're going to have to go visit the recording. So, it's June 9th, and here's a little quote again. So, it's volcanoes don't necessarily move from deep sleep to violent eruption in a straight order, in a straight orderly progression. So, that's just another way that scientists are having a hard time predicting this because it doesn't just go, "Oh, dead sleep, you know, this volcano is in dormancy to straight eruption. Sometimes it's ramped up, ramped down, ramped up, ramped down, ramped up, ramped down. That's just another thing that makes them so unpredictable, volcanoes. All right, we're going to turn the page. Dun, 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 dun. So there's this red thing right here that doesn't necessarily go along with the story. Does anyone know what this is called? Looking for lumps? What is this outside little thing called? Anyone know? Type it in my chat. What's that called? It's an extra add-on to the story. It is called the what? Side note. Thank you, Jaden. Yeah, it's a side note. It's extra or a side box. Side note, um, side box, whatever you want to call it. It's extra information that's going to help us better understand the story. So let's read Looking for Lumps really quick. Changes in the surface of a volcano give clues about what is happening beneath. Imagine a mold tunneling under a lawn. When the mold moves, the grass bumps up. Magma moving underground does the same thing. Actually, lifting the ground above it. When magma is close to the surface, the bulge can grow hundreds of feet high and hundreds of feet wide. So I'm sure you all walked on grass that like, you know, walking in the yard, boop, 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 boop. And then you step on something that's a little bit higher, then you sink down because a mole was sticking underneath. So it makes the ground bulge up. Okay, if you haven't done it landed, then just listen. Mrs. Kneifel's neighbor's yard has a ton of moles and that's happened all over the place. So what's happening is magma is moving underneath the ground, making the ground pop up, okay? Lava shove, shoved out of an erupting volcano can also make a massive bulge or dome. Domes and bulges might plug a vent, causing pressure to build underground. Domes can also grow so large that they may trigger landslides. So scientists have to track their growth too. Okay, a landslide is another natural disaster. So this natural disaster of a volcano could cause another natural disaster, a landslide. Oh my gosh, so much to deal with. How do scientists measure all these lumps and bulges? Digital evaluation maps compiled using photos and radar data show the length, width, and height of every part of the volcano. Scientists compare DM or DEMs, which would be digital um, evaluation maps, compiled at different times to track the shape of the volcano has changed. They can also make these measurements using satellite radar images, GPS, meters that track how the ground tilts, or by carefully surveying. So that is just a side note of yeah we already talked about a landslide a landslide is when land slides um it's like a mudslide or an avalanche 
So that's just a side note telling us how do we measure for these lumps? How do we know they're growing? They use GPS and they use radar and they use all these things to see it growing. So now we're on June 10th. So we started on May 28th, uh, then it was June 8th, and then it was June 9th, and now it's June 10th, 1991. Ooh, so I was wrong on the date. I said 1992, it was actually 1991. At 6 a.m., military television and radio echoed the order to evacuate. The streets of Clark Air Base filled with cars, trucks, and buses that funneled downhill through the shanty towns and towards the naval station an hour away. By noon, 14,500 people had evacuated. So what's the shantytown? Seven. I don't know. Let's look at the bottom. It's right down here. Shantytown, settlements on the outside of towns that consist of large numbers of rundown dwellings. If you are in my reading RTI, that would be a little text-to-text -text connection there because um, the Hooverville would be like a shantytown. So remember... In the Philippines, it's not developed, but the air base is developed. So all these people in the Air Force base actually have cars and trucks and buses, but the people in the towns don't. So the people in the Air Force base are quickly, in an hour, are able to leave the base where the other people are in the actual Philippines area have to evacuate early because it takes them longer because they don't have the cars, trucks, and buses. Left on the base were some officers, the military police, and the engineers who could keep the lights on. The volcano biologists moved their observatory to the furthest corner of the base. We were just incredibly believed that most everybody was out of the way, Andy said. So, okay, well, a shanty town is just a run downtown. Um, everyone is off the base except for just these few people, the scientists, the military police. Police. The people that are studying the volcano are basically the only people left on the base because they want to know what's happening. And they've moved to the furthest corner of the base, so that would be the furthest away from the volcano is what they're doing. But the pressure still weighed on the scientist. I couldn't help second-guessing myself, said team member Dave Harlow. All of us did. I was feeling as though the chances were pretty high that we would be halted in front of committees investigating the disastrous evacuation, its cost and the impact of the Philippines economy and the air force so once again they're still having this dilemma in their brain did we do the right thing by evacuating people it cost so much and was so much effort to evacuate people is it gonna all be for a waste if this volcano goes back to dormancy but then they're like, like if we didn't do it and people died then that we'd be blamed on that so they're still in their brain second guessing themselves here's a little picture and here's the um caption from above people evacuating to avoid the dangerous eruption so here are the people of the philippines evacuating they're literally using a bull and a cart unlike the people that are on the military base that are in cars trucks and buses but here's how people had to evacuate obviously that would be very time consuming would mount pinatoba really explode the next few days would tell andy woke up to a blue sky morning on june 12th all right, so now we skipped from June 10th to June 12th. It was after 6 a.m. and the clouds had usually rolled in by then, but the sun shone brightly as he waited for the geologist Rick Hoblet, who was going to give Andy a lift to the observatory. Let's go, Rick hollered from upstairs. Jeez, Andy thought, what's up with him? Rick raced down the stairs, taking two at a time, just as Andy opened the front door. Rick raced down the stairs. Oh, wait, sorry. A huge black ash column pumped out of the volcano, filling the sky. The column rose up higher and higher. Rick and Andy jumped into their truck and raced off. By the time they got to the observatory at the edge of the base, the ash column had hit the stratosphere. The, mu the cloud mushroomed out, reaching the sky right above them. So, dun, 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 dun. Obviously, Rick's yelling at him and taking the stairs two at a time. That shows urgency. That's like him being like, oh, my gosh, hurry up. We got to get there. So is our prediction going to come true? Is something bad really happening? Something is changing with this volcano. So we can assume something bad is going to happen. And just to review real quick, remember, this picture is showing people evacuating. So these were the, the Actus um, tribe people, and they are leaving their homes, carrying only what they can. And these people evacuating in this picture are obviously, they're roughing it compared to the people on the military base. 
dun dun. We're going to continue on. Oh no. Then the cloud slowed, stopped, and started to dissipate. So dissipate means go away. Whoa, woo, cool, the MPs hollered. They started doing a victory dance because they thought they'd seen the eruption and survived. So these military police, they're not trained in volcanoes. They thought, oh, snap, we just survived this, you know, volcano eruption. Go us. But Andy and Rick didn't dance. They turned to their instruments. They knew this could be just the beginning. For the next few days, Punatoba shot steam, rumbled, and kept the scientists on edge. Several times, the volcano shot up a column as big as the one on June 12th. So it's continuing to just look like it's going to erupt at any minute. But on June 14th, the volcano stopped shooting steam and ash. Punatoba shook as much as it had two days before, but nothing came out. The volcano was all stuffed up, Andy said. Okay, so something is causing all the vents of the volcano to be plugged up. So it's rumbling like steam and ash should be shooting out, but nothing's happening. Ooh, that doesn't sound very good to me. He fell asleep like that night, restless and worried. On June 15th, Andy and the other scientists were jolted from sleep by a cry. Get up! Get up! The scientists yelled the scientists on watch. Andy ran to the front door. Clouds obscured the top of the volcano and pelting rain blurred Andy's vision. But great black ash clouds, massive rolling clouds of the superheated ash raged down six miles on each side of the volcano. Okay, so what's happening here? They went to sleep and now they're being awoken by the scientists on watch. That means the scientists that's awake during this time. And all of a sudden clouds are coming and there's six miles on each side of the volcano of ash rolling down the volcano. Pyroclastic flows. Moments later, rain and wind from a typhoon that had hit the island completely hid the volcano erupt, the, hit, blah, blah, blah. Sorry, let me try that again. Moments later, rain and wind from a typhoon that had hit the island completely hid the erupting volcano. Okay, so now they have a typhoon. Oh my goodness. So the typhoon is most likely called by Oz all of the um, recent earthquakes. So now they're having a typhoon, a ton of rain. So the volcano is erupting and there's a typhoon. Clearly, it is a good thing that they did evacuate. Andy rushed to the seismographs. The earthquakes died down, weighed down, and stayed down. This is bad, Andy muttered. The pressure under the volcano is building. Should we evacuate? The scientists asked each other. The decision was quick. Someone yelled, evacuate the base! So remember, everyone is gone from the base except for just the scientists, basically. Everyone started moving all at once, gathering things, yelling, yelling officers, MPs, and scientists piled into the cars and sped away. From a big field, they watched the dark volcano. They waited. The volcanologists wanted to use, wanted to see their instruments. They wanted to find out what this volcano was up to so they could extend the evacuation zone if needed or learn something that would help at another crisis. But that would mean risking their own lives. So these volcanologists literally know they could die, but they're still wanting to help others. They're still wanting to learn about the volcanoes and everything happening. They decided they'd, be, they'd been too hasty to evacuate themselves. They drove back to the observatory and base along with the base commander. So they were like, oh my gosh. Oh wait, it's time to stop. It is time to stop. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Um, in one second, you are going to have one review question you are going to have to answer by tomorrow. You need to answer in a complete sentence. We will pick up here tomorrow. Thank you guys for joining. Thank you for telling me it was time to stop. Um, so this will be posted. The question was just um, asked right now. Thank you very much for joining. Mark, did you say something? Do we have to use radar or no? Because... No, it's just it's one question. Okay, thank you. All right. Bye, guys. Answer the question by tomorrow. Thank you for joining.
My class, I'll see you in language arts at one o'clock. Bye. Bye, my class, I'll see you at one o'clock in language arts. Okay. Oh, I don't know. Bye. Bye.